Hello guys and welcome to part 2 video which speaks about the skeletal muscle relaxants, those neuromuscular junction blockers specifically, and let's start with the video. We discussed earlier that we have two general types of the drugs that are used as skeletal muscle relaxants. We have the neuromuscular junction blockers and the spasmolytic drugs. And we know that the spasmolytic drugs are not in our focus and we focused on the neuromuscular junction blockers. We said that in the neuromuscular junction blockers, we have non-depolarizing, which were discussed in part two. And if you didn't see it, please see it, it will appear here. And in this part, we will focus on the depolarizing drugs which are uh, the second group in the neuromuscular junction blockers. Now this group, the depolarizing neuromuscular junction blockers, include only one drug that of uh, medical use. It is called as succinylcholine. It is a very important drug, and it is the only one of its kind we're using right now. And this is, as the name implicates, it is successive Choline. It is just similar to acetylcholine, the actual transmitter at the neuromuscular junction, but in this case, it is instead of being single part of acetylcholine, it is two acetylcholines. It's a structure of two acetylcholines linked to, to, to each other. And the problem with this uh, succinylcholine is that it, is, can, it cannot be broken down by the same uh, true, if we can say, the uh, true uh, choline esterase inhibitor. So here we have acetylcholine uh, esterase. This is the uh, break the, the enzyme that break down the acetylcholine. But here we cannot break down with this enzyme. Which uh, so no enzyme present at the synaptic cleft between the neuron and between the muscle that cannot uh, uh, that can uh, break down this this product. So succinylcholine is not broken down in the neuromuscular junction. This is the first uh, the first important information. Second is that succinylcholine is broken by a special uh, enzyme, it's called as pseudocholine esterase. This pseudocholine esterase is also only present in the plasma and also present in the liver. And this enzyme is the one that breaks the actual succinylcholine and the one that terminates its action after being administered. Now you remember from part one, this drawing shows the uh, nicotinic muscle receptor or the, uh, ion this ionotropic receptor, which is present at the neuromuscular junction, and it's, it, it is transmit the uh, impulse from the neuron into the muscle. Now this receptor, as we said, we have, have this special location here, which is for the, for the acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is supposed to bind to this uh, side here. Okay, in case of the depolarizing blockers, neuromuscular junction blockers, such as this succinylcholine, which is formed of two parts, so the succinylcholine comes and it grooves this part, confusing this receptor and allowing it to have conformational changes here, making the entry of sodium not organized. And actually it is cause excessive entry of sodium and increase in the intracellular levels of sodium. And also you have to put this in mind. Remember this till the end of the video that each sodium entry is accomplished, uh, accompanied with potassium exit okay this is important here so this excessive sodium inside will cause depolarization and that's why it is a depolarizing uh, blocker now you would say that depolarizing causes skeletal muscle contraction you're right but if there is persistent depolarizing depolarization in this case it wouldn't cause contraction it will start with early contraction but then this contraction will become persistent it will cause fatigue of the muscle and then failure of respond to any other stimulants coming from the neuron to stimulate this receptor now let's follow the uh, journey of the succinylcholine from administer uh, administration into the blood vessels it will be uh, administered uh, intravenous and then after being administered, it will come to the neuromuscular junction, and in the neuromuscular junction, it will start with the early, as I said, early uh, contraction, which is called it is known as fasciculations. These may persist up to thirty, up to sixty seconds, and these can be seen if you focused on the body of the patient. Uh, but they might, they can be masked by the general anesthesia given to the patient. Now, following this persistent depolarization. Following the, the early fasciculations, we have the fatigue. And this phase here is known as the depolarizing stage, or also known as phase one. This phase one is important because at this phase, 
the acetylcholine cannot stimulate this receptor and therefore the muscle is in deep relaxation and this stage remains for 5 and till 10 minutes and this is actually the time of duration of action of this succinylcholine in which short procedures can be done in this time. Now, successive use of this succinylcholine for, uh, for longer procedures, for example, the use up to 45 till 60 minutes, can lead to something known as phase 2, which is seen in some patient, that when you have used succinylcholine for long duration, now even, if you, even after uh, removal of this succinylcholine, which is done very slowly by the, as I said, plasma, uh, pseudocholinesterase, there will remain non-responsiveness, state of non-responsiveness of this receptor, and even the actual uh, acetylcholine cannot respond to this, cannot stimulate this receptor. It cannot right now. So what can we do? We can provide something that elevate the levels of acetylcholine, which is known as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, such as neostigmine, one of the most important drugs. Now this stage is also known as desensitization stage, stage in which the uh, the receptors cannot are not sensitive to acetylcholine. Now a small note must be uh, said here that this neostigmine it increases the level of acetylcholine. It is effective in the phase two reaction to restore the responsiveness or the sensitive the activity or respond to the acetylcholine. Okay, by increasing the levels of acetylcholine. But if you used uh, neostigmine, neostigmine in phase one, in which is uh, the muscles is in the depolarizing stage, uh, at this time the muscle is already depolarizing. So if you increase the levels of acetylcholine, which is also the actual depolarizer of the skeletal muscle, you would only increase, you would only cause the muscle to become in more deeper paralysis, uh, yani it will increase the paralysis of the muscle, leading to increase in the activity of succinylcholine. Now to summarize some therapeutic pharmacological properties of succinylcholine, it has a rapid onset of action, it also has a slow duration of action, rapid onset and slow duration, uh, ranging from 5 up to um, 10 minutes of action of skeletal muscle relaxation and also we said it is metabolized by the liver and the plasma pseudocholine esterase esterase next we have the therapeutic uses of succinylcholine it, it is used mainly in the short surgical procedures that require only five to ten minutes of smooth uh, of skeletal muscle relaxation, and the example of this one is the endotracheal intubation, which uh, uh, also again to prevent the injury of the uh, uh, of the muscles of the larynx and of the trachea. Now let's go to the adverse effects of the use of succinylcholine. Now we have first hyperkalemia, and as I mentioned before, there is persistent depolarization what's mean there is persistent entry of large amounts of sodium into the cell and to maintain the charge of the membrane we have to take out or there is there will be potassium efflux and if there is excessive potassium efflux lead to accumulation of the potassium outside leading to the hyperkalemia now this condition is life threatening because it may lead to arrest cardiac arrest and it may also be uh, exaggerated in cases of burns, muscle trauma, and spinal cord transections, as in, in, in case of penetrating stab wound in the back. Now, next one is the malignant hyperthermia. Uh, it is malignant because it is a rapidly progressing increase in the temperature of the patient after administration of succinylcholine. Now, does it occur always? No, it doesn't occur always. It occurs in special patients, about 50% of the patients that are uh, genetically predisposed to this condition. Now, what's going to happen? There, in these patients, uh, we have, uh, after entry of sodium, after entry of sodium to the cell, it, 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 it will go and it will stimulate uh, the endoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium into the 
uh, intracellular uh, uh, of the of the muscle. But in this case, the, the, the transporter here in the endoplasmic reticulum is known as rhinodine receptors type 1. And if there is mutation in these susceptible patient, we will have uh, abnormal conditions and abnormal metabolism in the muscle cell in the, with the calcium uh, uh, that are released from the endoplasmic reticulum following the uh, excessive entry of the sodium, leading to the excessive fasciculations of the skeletal muscles and the spasm of the muscle that can be seen directly with the elevation of the temperature, which is very progressive and increase rapidly, known as malignant hyperthermia. Now, as you remember, succinylcholine is made up of two molecules of acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is the agonist for the muscarinic receptors that are present in the uh, heart, so in the SA node to be specific. So, this um, succinylcholine can mimic the action of acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptor, leading to uh, inhibition of the SA node and leading to decrease in the heart rate which is caused the bradycardia, the third uh, adverse effect of succinylcholine usage. And this uh, side here can be adverse by the use of atropine, which is a muscarinic blocker that block the action of the muscarinic receptor. Next, we have uh, a very dangerous uh, adverse effect, which is the elevation of the intraocular pressure. Now, this is the eye. And in the eye, we have special extraocular muscles here. They are actually a skeletal muscles, and they are one of the most uh, uh, begin beginning cells to respond to succinylcholine paralysis, flaccid paralysis. But be before this paralysis, we said there is fasciculations, and this early fasciculations may be severe, causing the excessive uh, contraction of these extraocular muscles, leading to pushing on the uh, on the eyeball and leading to increase in the intraocular pressure of the uh, of the eye and this is very dangerous in cases of glaucoma and it is very uh, uh, must be uh, controlled in in cases of uh, elderly with uh, glaucoma now if you remember the pharmacological properties of succinylcholine we said that it is broken down by plasma pseudo Choline esterase, and in some patients, this plasma choline esterase is actually deficient, uh, genetically deficient, and those may suffer from prolonged paralysis, and there is loss of the activity of the muscle uh, for longer duration because there is no breaking down of this succinylcholine. There is nothing to break down this uh, molecule, and it will keep blocking the muscular, keep uh, making its action on the neuromuscular junction, blocking its activity. This may be uh, for one up to four hours of uh, post-operation paral uh, paralysis. And just to remember this, in all cases, we have to use the, uh, the ventilation, mechanical ventilation. And because this paralysis may affect the respiratory muscles leading to permanent apnea and death. Finally, if a patient has been using uh, uh, succinylcholine or got uh, used succinylcholine for long duration, uh, he might suffer from uh, post-operation muscle pain. Guys, we've finished this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed watching it, and if you did, please share it with your colleagues. And a sub to the channel would be amazingly supportive. Thank you, and see you in another video.